Moderator for our next panel, uh, you heard me talk about the ecosystem and the importance of connecting all of the different components to make this online experience work. And if there's a person in the planet who embodies that ecosystem and has established those relationships and who I'm sure many of you knew, it's Nancy Merritt. So Nancy, no further ado. Good morning. Oh boy, okay. Guys, we got a couple good days ahead of us. Can we do this again? Good morning. Hey, they're awake, John, thank God. <laughs> Um, well, thank you, Chris, for that intro. My name is Nancy Merritt. Uh, as Chris mentioned, I am a proud member of the global relationships team here at Mark Monitor. And um, in this vein that Stu and Troy mentioned of us kind of sharing something personal about ourselves, you know, I think we were all racking our brains last night, like, what are we going to say? Like, what do we want to know? Um, but given the upcoming presentation, I thought I would share that I have recently been taking firearms training. Um, bought my first handgun. You are in Idaho, after all. Uh, and I've gotten some pretty good feedback that I'm a pretty good shot. And in fact, my instructor said to me, um, had you ever considered becoming an agent? And I was like, yeah, that would be awesome, my next career. Well, as it turns out, I am well over the age limit, apparently. Yeah, there's an age limit. Thanks, John. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, perhaps John would be willing to make me an honorary member. But I am so excited that he's come all this way to join us to talk a little bit about the IPR Center and all their initiatives. So it's my honor to welcome to the stage Supervisory Special Agent John McNair. Hey, thank you. What do you want me here? I didn't know they lowered the age limit to 20, but um, well, that's, that's oh, so nice. It's not 20, but um, <laughs> John, thanks so much for being here. So before we kind of dive into some of the questions and things we want to cover off on, I know a lot of the folks in the room are familiar with the IPR Center, but there probably are a few that aren't. Could you just give us a quick overview of really what the center embodies and what it does and sort of what it's made up of? Absolutely. I love to, the chance to talk about the IPR Center, uh, any opportunity I get. The IPR Center is based out of um, Crystal City, Virginia, uh, soon to be the home of the new uh, Amazon headquarters area, and the, um, the center consists of, it's essentially a task force of enforcement agencies and regulatory agencies that have lanes in this fight. There are currently 25 agencies. My agency, uh, Homeland Security Investigations, uh, leads the center. We also have um, our partners that have very large footprints there from the FBI, Customs and Border Protection. There are five international partners, Europol, Interpol, the Government of Mexico, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and our latest partner, the uh, City of London Police. There are some partners there that you wouldn't typically think of that would be in this fight, such as the Nuclear Regulatory Commission or NASA or the Department of Defense entities. And, and perhaps a, a lot of people in this room might understand why they're there, but the general public typically doesn't because they don't think about counterfeit parts making their way into our defense systems, our communication satellites that are in orbit, our nuclear reactors, our guidance systems with uh, our fighter aircraft and our communications with our war fighters, whether it's a, a Cisco router that's been counterfeited or a, something as simple as a resistor or a diode. Thanks, John. So um, the center recently, you've sent agents out and done some trainings in Kenya and Thailand recently. Tell us what's kind of the center hoping to accomplish with those trainings and how do the folks in the room, how does that benefit us? Oh, that's a great question. And it really amplifies, um, Mark Monitor's president was, was spot on just a moment ago when, when Chris talked about it being a, a community, um, uh, uh, essentially a community fight. And we train local law enforcement, we train state police officers, we train um, other federal agents in what to look for in this fight and how to conduct these cases. These aren't your typical cases where you catch the bad guy with a kilo of cocaine and you put him in handcuffs and you've got him and you, you go to sentencing on it. Uh, these cases are extremely complex. They take a lot of time and there's a whole lot of other elements that we can get into that, that play into the prosecution on these cases. Anytime that we look at one of these entities, we confront it as it is not a local fight. It's not a fight against 
the community of what's happening within Boise or what's with, happening within Idaho or within the U.S. It's a global fight. These are very highly organized international criminal organizations. So we take that fight to the other side of the globe. We visit every corner of the globe and we bring training for how to investigate these types of cases to countries. We especially target countries that are on the Special 301 report. Um, we try to target countries that don't have access to this type of training because even I consider our partners with Customs and Border Protection to be phenomenal in what they do, but even if they were complete superheroes, which I think a lot of them are, um, and they were able to stop every single counterfeit product from coming into the United States, you still have this whole other side of the planet where your brands are being affected, where they're making their way into third world countries, into resorts, into cancer medications, into pharmaceuticals that are being spread throughout Africa, antiviral medications, and electronic components. Everybody thrives for these brands and they, they, uh, they have uh, such an appetite for a lot of the brands that we take for granted. And so these counterfeiters make their way, uh, their products will, uh, make their way throughout the globe. When one of these factories makes a run of these products, we know they're not being made just for the US market, they're being made for the global market. So when we take this fight around the other side of the earth into some of these other countries, and we get them in and we get them trained up. We now have partners in this fight. And so then it echoes again what we were just talking about, about it being a community effort, about, especially within law enforcement. We have representatives typically from a region of four or five countries wherever we land. And they are, they consist of officers, they consist of investigators, prosecutors, judges. We've even had some of their legislatures, some of their congressional uh, um, uh, personnel within there. And when we leave town, our attaches, whether it's our Homeland Security Investigations attache or the FBI attache or just uh, the State Department in general, they now have um, contacts that have been somewhat trained up in this area that when we have a lead in that area and we're looking for, maybe it's somebody that received a pretty good wire transfer or a shipper or a packer, we now have somebody that can help us in that fight and fill that piece into that case. Fascinating. So you have a fairly new leader at the center um, earlier this year, Steve Francis, and there are a lot of big initiatives coming out of your group right now. So you're collaborating with the ICC on the IP advisory group. I think we'd love to hear more about that. And then you also have the HSI Innovation Lab. So give us some context around those initiatives and again, how folks in this room might be able to contribute or take part in or, or leverage what's coming out of that. Definitely, those are, those are two great topics. First, the, the innovation lab, and probably the best way to, to speak to the innovation lab is to kind of paint a picture of what has been needed. Say we have an agent here in Boise, uh, a smaller office, that office being is being tasked with a lot of things, whether it's supporting the Secret Service for United Nations General Assembly security details that's going on now, or just a whole other litany of projects that's going on across the country. Those agents get pulled in a lot of different areas. So to concentrate fully on one particular case dealing with a counterfeiting or a, um, a, a counterfeit product um, distribution network, it takes a lot of resources. And one of the elements to the prosecution of these on the federal side especially, and throughout most of the state uh, districts, is for it to be, um, you have to establish knowledge that the person is knowingly trafficking in that counterfeit good. And really one of the great ways to get that is through the communications, the email communications, whether it's emails that we have pulled off of computers after we've been in the door and conducted search warrants, emails that we pulled off of accounts from previous cases that relate on this that perhaps led to this particular investigation, or, or just emails that we've obtained or we've gotten into from an undercover perspective. Uh, tip, typically these cases involve anywhere between 60,000 and 260,000 emails that an agent, that that agent, perhaps here in Boise, 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 yeah. would have Keep to practicing. go through, <laughs> I'm, I'm learning, uh, would have to go through and that they just simply don't have the time. So a lot of those emails are also on different um, service provider platforms and to put those together in a timeline to kind of kind of paint a picture for a jury, a prosecutor. Uh, it, it takes a lot of specialty work 
And the Innovation Lab has been phenomenal with that. An agent can go to them and say, I have all this stuff. I can't go through it. I can't get the exculpatory stuff that I have to provide as well to the defense attorneys. I can't paint a timeline for this. And let's face it, with all these shows that we see on TV now, a jury expects to have a screen and a perfect kind of event. And it all needs to play out in 30 minutes. And um, so uh, for that particular agent or that office to be able to go through that, they have to rely heavily on someone. And the creation of the Innovation Lab last year um, has been incredible with that. And we'll speak to it again here in just a moment uh, whenever I get the opportunity to talk about what we're doing on some of the e-commerce stuff. Uh, hopefully you'll let me talk about that. And the other question was, the or the other point was the advisory board. And again, it, it echoes exactly what we just heard. This is not a fight of just law enforcement going after these. I think we've seen all too often that law enforcement goes along and they conduct their investigations. Rights holders conduct their investigations. Sometimes they talk to a couple of each other and then usually you find out about it at some conference somewhere on the other side of the, uh, in another country or something. Oh, that's what happened in that case that was being worked for the last five or six years. The IPR Center, I, I kind of reiterated to earlier, is a partnership of, of enforcement and regulatory agencies so why not have that as a partnership with the rights holders as well? Why can't they have a seat at the table? Why can't they participate in these side by side? We have to navigate a lot of, of, of speed bumps, if you will, with the, um, the Federal Advisory Council Act and, and, and things that, that come into play that we end up triggering when we start letting private industry tell government how to do their job and vice versa. And so we're getting around a lot of that. And it's been a great success so far. I predict a lot of great things from this. Essentially, it's going to bring rights holders into the IPR center, front and center on this fight. And there are so many subject matter experts that we can have access to within the rights holders, within the companies, whether it's um, people that are already doing what the Innovation Lab is doing, or whether it is somebody that has a, a specialty knowledge in the design of this particular circuit, or this particular pharmaceutical, or this particular um, material or fabric. So it really gives us an opportunity to have a lot more access to a lot more resources, and vice versa from the private industry side as well. And so I'm, I'm already going to go off script, sorry. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> but on the, I know, on the IP advisory group, um, and we work closely, of course, with Bob Barkeese and the team at IACC, um, but if I understand correctly or if you can share, so it's, it's made up of representatives kind of from the different industry, what we call verticals, right, apparel or auto, so potentially people in this room are on it, and then there's going to be almost kind of a resource or reference pool um, of folks as well that they can kind of leverage for different projects or things. Is that, is that fairly accurate? I mean, that's, the group is kind of still being formed. Is that right? That's correct. It's in its infancy, and we're really trying to make sure that we cover the full spectrum of, of um, knowledge. We get a lot of, uh, we call them get backs, uh, daily. Um, uh, perhaps Senator Cassidy's staff is asking for some advice on something where they're drafting some legislation. So to be able to have access, to be able to go into the database and pull, okay, we need all the attorneys from across the fight of IP, not just the government attorneys, but how do we quickly get access to rights holders attorneys so that they have a right voice in this and they can get a say in this as well. Um, perhaps it's something to where we're looking at some type of uh, technology that we found out that's being infringed. How do we get quick access to the people that work within the semiconductor industry without just simply asking around the IPR center, does anybody know anybody at Texas Instruments or does anybody know anybody at AMD? So it, it helps us to be able to have very quick access to a lot of the kind of subgroups or the verticals, if you will, the automotive industry or the, the pharmaceutical industry across the board. Uh, so let's talk about the e-commerce working group. When we did a similar event to this uh, in New York, uh, some folks in the room may have been there as well. Um, I sat up here with Julian uh, from eBay, and he talked about that group a little bit as much as he could share. And again, understanding um, there might not be everything we can share, but that's being led by the IPR Center as well, correct? It's a combination of a lot of those e-commerce platforms. How's that going, and what's the, what's the progress look like? That's correct, and that is perhaps one of the most exciting things that I like to talk about. And again, it, it echoes exactly what we just heard. You have the law enforcement doing their part in this. You have the rights holders doing their part in this. If you think about within the rights holders, one individual e-commerce platform where perhaps who knows how many thousands or tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of 
of um, monikers are being utilized to sell counterfeit merchandise. Whether we know it yet or don't know it, whether they've been identified by the e-commerce platform or not, and it's the whack-a-mole picture. Perhaps you shut down one moniker, but you don't know about the other 50 monikers that that particular organization or person is operating under. That's just one platform. What about all the other platforms that are being sold on that we know from previous investigations that that particular person or criminal organization is also operating on? And how do we get those to talk to each other um, a lot of times they may not want to because one may not want the other one to know what kind of data they collect, they collect or whether they're grabbing IP addresses or, or what, they, what kind of information they hold. And they've all developed over the years their own kind of language within their, their data collection. How do we get all that to mesh together so that we can get real-time information from this e-commerce platform to this e-commerce platform to this one? Now let's take that to another um, uh, idea, if you will. What else is being used to traffic those counterfeit goods? They have to be paid for. So now let's bring in the payment um, platforms and let's let them get a conversation in this and give us some data. And um, perhaps if you think about it, of just simply taking the top 500 violators from each e-commerce platform and dumping them into a big uh, fish tank and then taking that and being able to pull out and talk to the, the payment mechanisms and say, okay, well, they're also utilizing these same ad, the IP addresses to check their payments or to send payments or to collect their payments. Then what about the freight forwarders or the shipping, the, the um, small parcel delivery systems? So once we start taking all that into the environment and have law enforcement with the ability to reach in and grab that and swirl it around and also pull out the other monikers that they're using, that's going to make phenomenal cases for us to be able to present. And we're going to, at the end of the day, when we've completely identified the entire criminal organization behind this particular network, and we've completely um, disrupted that, whether it's through arrest or seizure of assets or all the above, then only then will have, have we really made a phenomenal case. It's great to be able to high five each other at the seaport or the airport and say, look at all this merchandise that we got. But how much did we really get from that organization if it's counterfeit shampoo or Rolexes? Yeah, and I imagine that's probably started out as a bit of a challenging task, right? Because essentially you're bringing together competitors into a room to collaborate. Uh, and knowing that at the end of the day, we all want to make it a, a better, safer place. But, you know, everyone sort of has their own goal and their own business to run. You have the Ebays and the Amazons and the Alibabas of the world. And then to put them in a room and get them to kind of work together on this problem. Do you feel like that's gone fairly well? Or, I mean, I'm sure we'd all love to be a fly uh, on the wall in that room. but. <laughs> It's gone, it's gone really well, and we've had some great um, organizations, some of which are probably represented here, such as the Automotive um, Anti-Counterfeiting Coalition, the A2C2. And when we start talking about, we almost have to segment it where we look at automotive competitors, where they fiercely compete for customers on one side of, of the, uh, the, the boardroom, but on the other side, why can't their anti-counterfeiting or their brand protection sections work together and they've done a great job. They've learned a lot and we've been able to really pull from them and, and kind of see what they've had to encounter. And we're starting to see that play out now within the pharmaceutical sectors, within the microelectronic sectors, within the, the, uh, the other sectors. And then I think that ultimately all those sectors come together on something such as the IP Advisory Council where, they, uh, where we all join together as one. When we have one voice which is just a individual enforcement agency, it's not that loud, but when we take all of the 25 partners at the IPR Center and we amplify those together and speak together as one, it gets a little louder. Then when we take all the industry together and we put them together, I think not until we come together as one community and attack this that we'll see the most success. So, John, I've heard it said many times over the years in this industry, and, and you said the same thing when we talked, that we will never arrest or seize our way out of this problem. So what do we do then? That's funny. I get so much grief for saying that. I said that a few times, and I well, swear not, by it. you're not the only one. I really have heard it many times. So We have to make the seizures. We have to get the shipping containers full of merchandise. We have to arrest. But at the end of the day, if we arrest every single day and make seizures every single day, there's still that appetite for these brands, for these, these things. And when you look at the amount of profit that the counterfeiters are making simply by copying a trademark and putting that sense of 
of guarantee that that product is good on their, their piece of crap and you put it on there, they're gonna see an immediate profit increase. They're, they've immediately increased what money they've made by doing that. And so until we take those seizures and those arrests and we couple those with the rights holders investigations and we come together as one community, uh, one ecosystem, if you will, everybody together, at least this is the belief of, of myself as well as, uh, as almost all my colleagues at the center and, and throughout the industry. When we come together as one fighting this together, that's when I think we'll see the most progress, not just one agency seizing or arresting within their own and doing a great press release. Those are outstanding, those are phenomenal, but we need to build upon that. We've been doing that for so long and we're getting left behind. Okay. Let's um, change gears a little bit. So I'm curious um, your philosophy or the center's philosophy on consumer education. So we've had a lot of discussion again over you know several events in the last few years about how much do we want to educate just the general consumer about counterfeits and the dangers and the impact, knowing that it is feeding terrorism, um, you know, all kinds of horrible things, um, which we've talked about and done studies on. But, um, you know, what's, what's the center's philosophy or role in consumer education, knowing that some brands don't want to share too much because there's a downside to that? Um, do you see kind of an opportunity there for the center to get involved in that from kind of an outward standpoint? I do. I see a phenomenal opportunity. The center is based on basically three pillars. The interdiction side, which we feed a lot of intelligence to the border officers throughout the world in order to help them um, interdict some of the, the shipments. Uh, as an example, We've uh, been feeding the Colombian National Police a lot of intelligence that we've gathered on shipments that are going through after we got down there and trained them. And shortly afterwards, they seized seven shipping containers full of nothing but counterfeit shampoo passing into Colombia. And so the interdiction side works great when we, uh, when we come to it as one, um, uh, uh, one community. The other side of that is the, the investigative side, if you will. Uh, basically, what do you do with that product when it's being interdicted? Great, you interdicted it, but there's a lot more behind it that you didn't even know about. So how about doing the investigations and how about getting all those networks um, uh, prosecuted? And the third pillar, which I see as equally important, if not more important in some areas, is the outreach side of that. We have to educate the consumers. We have to get the community involved in this. We have to let the youth know that this isn't cool to, to be wearing the counterfeit item. The amount of um, forced labor, perhaps, that went into that, the criminal networks that run those um, as literally gangs in order to move that product, the, the money laundering that goes into that that also launders uh, funds and finances from other crimes, um, just the whole um, uh, underworld that that one particular counterfeit item opens up if we're not even talking about the health and safety, we're just simply talking about the production of that. Uh, we have to get that education out there. We have to get that outreach conducted. And I really think that when you see things, uh, when, you, when you see communities within the rights holders come together, such as A2C2, where they may compete fiercely during the Super Bowl on commercials for customers, but then coming back around and coming together and partnering perhaps with the National Crime Prevention Center and, and getting McGruff the dog out there and talking about some of this at different events and coming together as one. When we see all of those individual sectors coming together and everybody voicing this. Um, when I came to the, to the IPR Center, I, I didn't and I still don't have a Twitter account, but one of, my, uh, one of the things that fell into my lap was um, the, the individual that runs the the public facing media, including the Twitter account, came under me. And one of my goals that was presented to me was you have to increase our Twitter followers by 20%. So I started looking at that. I'm like, okay, we had 700 and something Twitter followers. <laughs> so how hard is that? But even if I tripled, and, and we'll triple them this year, we'll get up, uh, we'll get up around 2,000. And even if I tripled that every single year for three or four years, at best we're talking 20, 23,000 Twitter followers. And the people that are following the IPR Center already know what the harms are essentially for that. But if we take our partners from the IP Advisory Board and we take all of our agencies that are with us and we can use, we can cross over, and we've talked about this before, where perhaps we get the brand protection side of that company or of your companies to go over to the advertising side. And a lot of you have 
media, social media influencers that you pay a lot of money to wear your product, why not have them tweet something out about? We saw that with the, um, the Kylie makeup. Um, she tweeted out something and it just went crazy about don't wear counterfeit makeup. A lot of people don't realize until they start looking at it that the amount of, of items that show up on lab reports from counterfeit makeup, the lead, the beryllium, the items that we would never in a million years let anywhere near us, let alone be having rubbed into the pores of our skin. Um, but it feels right and it looks right and the color's right. And hey, instead of, you know, that stuff is marked up so high and, and I'm not gonna go there about how much money my wife spends on makeup or how much she needs it and I'm glad that she wears it. But, but when we go, <laughs> I did, I did, I went there, didn't I? Sorry. <laughs> but, but when you look at the markup on makeup and you start thinking about how much opportunity there is for the counterfeiters and they don't care about the safety of our loved ones of what were they're putting onto their skin and rubbing into the pores. Um, until we start getting some of those, uh, perhaps within our own companies, crossed over into the actual advertising side versus the brand protection, that that voice gets really loud and I think we can really make a difference. Yeah. The counterfeit makeup thing totally freaks me out. There was an article two weeks ago of a gal who had bought some counterfeit moisturizer, um, put it on her face and is now in a coma. She's 47 years old because it had high levels of mercury and she essentially got mercury poisoning. So you just, you don't stop to think and that's the piece I think that is so fascinating to me is getting consumers to really think about. And you know, obviously we've always had, the internet has created this sort of, I don't know, ideal of like you can get the best deal and it comes in one day shipping or two day shipping. Like it's, it's conditioned all of us to consume in that way. Um, without kind of stopping to think about the bigger picture. So let's stop there with the questions for a minute. Surely there's got to be some questions out here in the group, in the audience. Anybody? Aquino is ready. Aha, I see a hand. Okay, so speaking of the counterfeit makeup, and, you know, I've been in the business for a long time, so I'd like to think that I can recognize things, but you really can't. And there's a lot of stuff on the Internet, so I'm going to ask kind of the the stupid question in the room, but how can you tell the difference if it's a counterfeit, like, uh, makeup? That's, like, a, that's a great question. Not a, not a stupid question No, all, that's a phenomenal yeah. question, and it's getting more and more difficult to tell. It's scary. We used to say, if it, you, you know, the adages of, if it appears to be too good, it probably is too good of a deal. But even now, the price points are very similar. The packaging is very similar. Um, our agents in the field used to be able to look very quickly at something, perhaps a, a Prada handbag, and say, oh, there's no way that that's real. It, it's bad because of this, this, and this. Um, counterfeit makeups included. They're having to be sent not only to our government labs now, but also to the actual industry lab to have the full spectrum run to say, oh, no, this peak is perhaps beryllium, or this peak is, is, is um, uh, some type of... Uh, um, uh, component that is not in our in our makeup, so it is not right. The the packaging is getting phenomenal. The price points are getting phenomenal, and now they're making their way into what we consider the legitimate stream, i.e., stream, i.e., the e-commerce stream. Before you would stay away from the shady alley business, but now when that shady alley business has made its way right onto the front of your screen. And when that doctor is on that, that website, and you know he's a doctor because he has a lab coat on, and it says he's a doctor, so he's a doctor, <laughs> right? And so now whenever you're ordering those pharmaceuticals and that perhaps that Lipitor or that, that uh, whatever that particular medicine might be is, is very similar, if not just teasingly lower than what you're paying, um, you, and you can get it without having to leave the house. Oh my gosh, how much of a pain is it to go around the corner and actually get in line at the pharmacy for five minutes? Now you can just push the button and it's there when you get home the next day. So uh, when we start seeing that, it, it's, it's scary. It's not a dumb question, it's, it's very scary. And a lot of the stuff that we used to depend on isn't necessarily applicable anymore. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I, I have a personal rule that I, I share with my friends and family in, in, in industry that anything you're going to put in or on your body, plug into a wall or turn on, I, I personally don't buy from any third party um, site at all. So I think, you know, be willing to pay the full amount, the extra amount and go directly to the manufacturer site and go from there. And a lot of sites now have been listening to who their authorized distributors are. I mean, I think no matter what, there's always a risk, but you can certainly lessen it by kind of following some of that. 
I should have brought my eyeball picture. I love this time of year. Oh, no. I, I hate this time of year because it, we're coming up on Halloween and all of our kids, and us included, we want to have cat eyes for Halloween or we want to have green eyes or blue eyes. And you see that and you think, okay, what's the harm? I'm going to pop it in for a day or two and then I'm going to go on about my business. And when I show the pictures, it just I love to stand by the screen and make people stare at it. We've got so many cases after cases after cases. The legitimate contact lenses have a coating on there that keeps it from adhering to the eyeball. And when you start looking at these, and we call them counterfeits, and perhaps they're just off brands, not even trademarked, but they're the, the ones that you don't have to go to the doctor to get. You get them at the costume store, you get them at the whatever convenience store, and it's, it's convenient, or you get them online and you put them on and we're seeing over and over where they're having to be removed with a scalpel and causing permanent damage to the eye because they don't Make have that coating and, and they too. adhere. Oh. So Thank you we for use, not bringing that picture. <laughs> we oh. use, this is the equivalent of the cane pulling me off the stage, I get it. But we use uh, events such as Halloween to be able to kind of promote that and try to get the voice out locally within, within our offices. What's the, now we're really going off script now. What's the craziest thing in just in you personally? Because I know you have a display case, which I love, at the IPR center that has some counterfeits that have been confiscated over the years. Um, and my favorite is like the counterfeit, the counterfeit condoms next to the counterfeit pregnancy test. I'm like, this is a serious disaster. Just all, I mean, wah. like what's the craziest thing that you've ever seen be counterfeited? There's no limit now, right? It used to be, the Rolex watch and the Louis Vuitton handbag, but now we see it. And something that still baffles me that I would have never thought of, I was, I was running the IPR group out of our Dallas office, and we had a, um, um, about two hours outside of Dallas, a, a drilling platform uh, that was drilling in the Barnett Shell for natural gas. And this system that goes into place is, it's backed up. They literally have essentially appointments for the, for the rest of the year. And I forget what the numbers are while this thing is on the ground, but it's essentially hundreds of thousands of dollars per day that this thing is costing to sit on the ground and drill these holes into the ground before it gets moved to the next place. And the bearings at the top of this are the size of, of almost one of these tables. It's the head bearing and the shaft goes through this and the bearing holds it centered and they get these things however far down into the ground and they can turn them and go under the land that they don't have the surface rights. It's just incredible the technology that they have. These bearings are sixty and seventy thousand dollars and one of them failed. The machine went or the machine, the whole thing went down for a couple of days while they got another bearing out there. They got it into place. They got the crew back into place and they're gonna try to play catch up now. They were already running twenty four hours a day. Now they're gonna run 28 hours a day. I don't know what they're going to do, but they're going to come up with a way. That maybe they just tell them, oh, we went 10,000 feet and we're good. But um, the engineers didn't even make it back to the airport and the new bearing had failed. And this, this company was, what is going on? And of course, they're furious because now there are even more hundreds of thousands of dollars behind that they've lost. The bearings were counterfeited, branded, stamped, everything. But for a factory to set up and to run a production of bearings for specifically for drilling platforms. And this thing basically just had a nuclear meltdown above the heads of all these workers and parts were flying, hot molten parts were flying where this bearing just essentially disintegrated onto all these people, let alone all the pressures that are under these, the hydraulic pressures. So yeah, we see all of the, the laptops on the planes that are melting down from the counterfeit uh, lithium ion batteries, or we saw the, the, you know, we're seeing a lot of the e-cigarettes now that are, that are going into nuclear meltdowns, basically. We're seeing a lot of that, and that stuff's just fascinating because it's like a car crash. But to think that they've actually made their way beyond the pregnancy tests, beyond the counterfeit condoms, which is next to the counterfeit Viagra and Cialis too. So, you know, and, <laughs> and party, made their everybody. way now. Oh, yes, that's, <laughs> and now they've made their way all the way into just every facet of our lives, so. That's fascinating. Oh, by the way, one last picture. I think I saw Charlie close his eyes. So just one last for the right. <laughs> I don't know, I'm watching you. <laughs> Any other questions from the group? Yeah, Maribel. There's another one back there. I just have a quick comment. Um, so when these counterfeit items are presented on e-commerce market sites and they use like our images, which 
really confuses consumers because it looks so good and it looks so legit. <clears throat> this is where our work is as menial as it might be, like enforcing our copyright image comes into play because then we're forcing them to take pictures of their crappy product. Yep. Yeah, agreed. Someone and, else back there had a... And while she's heading over to him, you bring up a great point that we picture these items being seized as items that we have to hold in our hand and touch and put a sticker on and put into an evidence bag. But we're talking about streaming and we're talking about um, uh, set-top boxes or now with the, the equivalent of like the fire sticks and the amount of malware that's making its way into a lot of these. People don't realize, oh, what's the harm in not paying for that pay-per-view fight or that football game or that, that uh, what have you. Um, when you're, you're literally inviting the criminals into your living room whenever you're streaming a lot of this stuff. And we're all, my grandparents, my kids, myself, we're all generationally a lot more comfortable handing over our personal identifiable information, our credit cards, our, our whatever it may be, our medical information, our social security number to some of those websites for the pharmaceuticals. So. This is why I worry about like the counterfeit, like an Alexa or a Google Home or a Nest or something. Like, that just freaks me out. Somebody in the back. Yeah, I was wondering if you, if your center was involved with the, there was a big cell phone counterfeiting operation here in Boise, Idaho. I was wondering how you were involved with that. I'm not familiar with that particular case itself, but if there was anything that was counterfeit in uh, any type of, especially within the cell phone or the communications industry, it absolutely would have came through the center, whether it was the FBI that would have run it through the FBI with their, their partners at the center or us, we all have uh, uh, essentially, and I, I didn't really touch on it, the IPR center works great for deconfliction and coordination. Um, perhaps in the pharmaceutical world, the Food and Drug Administration agents might be working a case. Well, our agents in Los Angeles might be working a case as well as the FBI in New York that all ties in together. So we work very good for bringing all of our information and giving each other complete access to all of our systems so that we can see that. So any counterfeit cases that are worked, especially at the federal level, go through the center, so. Can I, can I call you out, Clark? So Aquino, uh, Agent Harshbarger right there, who's our local FBI um, agent we work very closely with, can, what, what he can share, which might not be a lot about that particular case, it's, it's pretty fascinating. So my name's Clark, Harsh, Clark Harshbarger. I'm a uh, cybersecurity agent for the FBI, local here to Boise. Uh, we're thankful for the IPR Center and other big organizations like that. It makes our job easier. These types of crimes are geographically independent. They happen everywhere. And for the FBI, we're able to conduct investigations where we have subject matter expertise or where the crime is committed, whatever is most relevant. In this case, last year, it was one of the largest hardware electronic counterfeiting operations in the world at the time. And it was taken down here in Boise over by the West Side YMCA Center. Uh, it's currently pending adjudication. They're working through the the defense is working through the evidence right now, but it's a really neat case where we cooperated with Mark Monitor and other industry experts from UL, Apple, Samsung, uh, and others, and it was a real benefit to take down an operation that was conducting millions of dollars of counterfeit sales, allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions from the group? Oh, Mark. So obviously there's a gigantic and massive counterfeit goods problem. Does the IPR Center get involved in counterfeit services issues, which is increasingly an issue where you know, uh, fake agencies will pretend to be airlines or legitimate travel agencies and they will scam consumers? Okay, that's, that's a good question. And, and we've seen that utilized in cases in the past where perhaps the best or one of the charged statutes would have been the use of that particular company's trademark, maybe on some letterhead or some literature. But typically, those fall within our financial crimes sections. Each of the agencies, or for the most part, the, the large agencies at the IPR Center, such as the FBI and Homeland Security Investigations, have um, not only do they have IP sites, but they also have financial fraud. The, the Egyptian or the, the Nigerian prince that, that emails you that we were talking about earlier, and uh, the lottery scams and the scams such as this 
fall within that. There's been a lot more um, collaboration, especially through things such as the Innovation Lab, where those entities come together. They don't just sit over in their particular centers. We have centers for the, the financial crimes. We have centers for uh, cyber crimes. We have the, the IPR center. And those were designed to specifically target uh, kind of little niches within crimes, if you will. And so we're having to see those um, uh, talk more and more and more and come into contact with each other more and more. Uh, as an example, the IPR Center used to have one particular program that concentrated on nothing but e-commerce. Well, now all of the things that we've seen counterfeiting fall within e-commerce, so we're having to move those kind of out of their niches and almost be like a blanket over all the crimes. So uh, we would get involved with that, but almost always we're going to defer that to the, because uh, that's, that's essentially a scam just for ripping you off for nothing more than money. They're just simply trying to give you take your money from you, correct? I'm talking about where they're impersonating their Right. I've seen those cases briefed before and they usually come briefed out of our financial crime section or our cyber crime section. Uh, for the most part, the statutes that we deal with, the 18 U.S.C. 2320s deal with particularly with trafficking a, a counterfeit good or an item, so. Any other questions before we wrap up? So the IPR Center does have um, an event coming up, right, specific to kind of IP, maybe in November you're doing your symposium We've typically done a symposium maybe. every year, maybe. <laughs> this year they're going to twist it up just a little bit and it's gonna be more of a media blitz campaign and outreach and it's gonna be focused on health and safety. Um, they're uh, looking really close at how to navigate the world around that's currently going on with the vaping, the e-cigs and, and the items such as that. Um, how do you, um, on one hand, protect these um, uh, protect the public from this, but on the other hand, also know that uh, sometimes this isn't necessarily counterfeiting as much as it is items that are being mixed at home and, and sold throughout the industry. So um, under not a particular brand. So we're, what was typically our IPR center symposium where we essentially give a state of the IPR world every year, this year is gonna be much more of a, um, a, an engagement with Congress, an engagement with all of our agencies and to go out and do more of a media campaign or a blitz on the awareness. Fascinating. Well, if nothing else, John, thank you so much for coming all this way to join us. You're here the next couple of days, so please find him during the break. Um, happy to have more conversations. You're going to throw axes with us tonight, yes, right? Yes, Fantastic. yes. I'm oh, taking yeah. that on the plane. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah, we hope you get the trophy. Um, all right, thanks so much, everybody, for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Glad we didn't see that eyeball picture. I wear contacts, so thanks for that new anxiety. Uh, but the QR codes, the push notifications, so I just want to clarify that. Text forum19 to 77948. This is in your program. This will also get you direct links to the surveys to fill out. So I just wanted to come up here and clarify that. Make sure you sign up for that, fill out those surveys. And I think we're good for break. Thanks.